Okay, right. Okay, so today I'm on a Zoom call, the wonders of modern technology, to Michael Fordham. Uh, for, going to be known from now on as Mick. Thanks, Mick, for agreeing to talk to us over there. Uh, bring over some sunshine. No worries. Um, so how would you describe what it is you do? I'm here in the Philippines at the moment, professional punter, come tipster. Okay, so we're just what, building what, up. We're just what, building it up. But you've been, you've been uh, applying your trade over here. For, well, you're, you're from the UK, obviously. So wh when did you move to the Philippines and why are you over there? Right, so basically, uh, we moved to the Philippines six months, seven months ago, something like that. We've got family out here, and it was a case of whether to go to Spain, to go to Greece, but because of all the things that are going on over there with Brexit, we decided the Philippines, and that's it. Okay, so you just moved lock, stock, and barrel? Lock, stock, and barrel. We sold everything. Uh, and then I had contacts over here while I was in the UK and it was getting to learn the Filipino way of betting, racing, etc., like that. Okay, right. So I've just pinned it now because you didn't want to see me in it. Um, so we'll talk about the Philippines uh, racing in a bit. So how long have you been making money back in horses? So back in earning money and doing it as a living since I was like, in, in my early 30s, in my early 30s, uh, but yeah, early 30s, that's when I started making the living out of it. Okay, so 20 us, plus years. Tell us a bit about how you um, how you got into it. Are you, you're telling me before we did this interview that you're interested in watching people in the betting shops doing their one and six forecasts and Union Jacks and stuff like that, but you're interested in the guys that just came in, had a bet and left again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it, it was funny because every day I would go in there and you would see all these what we call mug punters doing six and one forecasts and doing the favourites, second favourites. But you'd, you'd get to know the fact we call the faces. What well, I walk in, say hello, acknowledge her and things like that. And then they would go put their bet on, either watch the race or they would go go out. So, but were those? So, did you sort of find out about those guys, who who they were, what they were up to? Is it? Tell us a bit about how yeah, you, you sort of. It, yeah, it's, yeah, it's because like everybody, what was in the book is at the time, they go, oh, so and so's coming in, so and so's here, like that. Try to see what he's betting, like that, because he knows he's in the know, and uh, yeah, so. I got talking to I'll, I'll get talking to him. I've got more front than Sainsbury's Simon, so I would talk to anybody. When did you when did you start winning? What was the what was the thing that turned you from a betting shop punter into a winning punter? It, it was like I say in in my thirties, and I've read all the books, Nick Morden, betting for a living, and things like that, like we've all done, and. I had a few conversations with people at the racetracks and I got to learn that like specialise, specialise, don't bet every day. And people, the people I bumped into at the race courses like that, it was all, it was, I wasn't looking for a tip off room or anything like that. I was just interested how they operated. Okay. So when you were, when you were still a, bet, a betting shop punter, um, you know, what was your sort of angle? Did you start making money when you're in, in the betting shops? Was it before, when you went on course that you started to get a few quid? It was on course. It, it, it was definitely on course. Uh, like I say, prior to, in my younger days, it was a case of like, I would skive off school with my dinner money, go to toaster races. And you get to you get to know people, and it was just the fascination of watching, as we called it back in the day, the betting jungle, the betting ring, and getting to know all the faces there. And it it wasn't until literally that I found employment. I was working. I was getting to the races, and that's when 
the penny clicked about making money and earning money for betting horses, looking for the value. That was the first thing I got taught. Look for the value in a race. Look for the value and be disciplined. And what, what sort of things did you cut out by being disciplined? The, the, I found that like by keeping notes of what I was interested in, the jumps, I found out a large part of my bets were going down due to fallers and things like that. So I wiped that out. I also looked back and the flat was giving me a good profit, a nice tidy profit on the flat. And then I shortened it back down again. And that flat was going on to the all weather racing. And that's where my bigger profits was on the all weather. Several Wolverhampton, not so much Newcastle, but several Wolverhampton, Chelmsford, they was they was the courses for me. Okay, and it was interesting that you I you told me that you had a bookmaker that used to lay your paper prices. And we've heard we've heard <laughs> these <laughs> there's not many people that have actually been able to get them. So uh, what was the story with him? Uh it was Brian Goodyear, back bookmakers in Wellingborough, Northamptonshire. And one, it was one day I went Windsor races and I fancied this horse at Windsor. It got, and I had a big bet on it and it got beat by a short head, a head, something like that. I can't remember the name of the horse, but I lost, lost big time. And every day is a schooling day. And I was talking to people and they go, what are you back? What are you back? And I told them and they go, no, 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 no. If Pat Edry stays for the last at Windsor, always back Pat Edry. So got home, taxi driver brought me home and things like that. And I watched it for two, three, four weeks in the bookies. And our local bookie would always give me, give everybody the sporting life prices. And I, within them four weeks, whatever it was, of finding out about this little Pat Edry thing at Windsor, it, he would always finish odds on six to four, something like that. The sporting life prices was given 11 to two, six to one, five to one. And I'm thinking, right, yo. So because the guy in the book is, would give us, yes, uh, the sporting life prices, it was a case of... Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to take a bit of this 5-1 to one and 11-2 to two and whatever the sport in life are doing. And, yeah, it, I might have lost on the night, but on the long term, which is what's it all about, it was, yeah, we, he didn't like it. He didn't like it one bit. No, that didn't, that, that didn't last very long then. That didn't last. It lasted, it, it, it lasted roughly four to six months because... He stopped me from doing it. And then it, then I got my friends to put the bet on for me because they were still getting the paper prices. I would wait outside the bookmakers like that. And uh, so that was going on for a little while. And then he, he, he thought something was wrong and he followed my friends out of the bookies and there I was outside waiting to collect some money off of them. And... Uh, that was it. He uh, at the end of the day, he turned around and said, "That's it. No more paper prices for anybody. You've spoiled it for everybody." Okay. So do you, you, we're going to talk about one of your biggest mentors in a bit. Who was a big, uh, I was a big fan of, but um, and also another nice chap that I sort of know to say hello to is Kevin the Colonel Minter. How did you get involved with Kev? Kevin, he's he's from the same area as me, Wellingborough, and with Kevin. It was a case of like, I got to know his dad, bless him, his late dad. And uh, yeah, I was speaking to Stan, his dad, and we was taught, we always taught, we always went into the same bookmakers in, in Wellingborough, Labrooks, Goodyears, or another one I can't remember. And we was always talking and then Kevin would come in, tell his dad a bit of information. And yeah, it was like that. So me, <laughs> excuse me. Me and Kevin keep in touch, the odd message now and again, and now he's at Henlo doing the commentating. Okay, do any, any particular things that you learned from Kevin that stood the test of time? 
Yeah. And it's the same with, and it was the same with my mentor. Say little and listen a lot. Like that. It was, Kevin was a shrewd punter. He was, he very hard, he would hardly tell anybody apart from his dad and a few good friends. But yeah, say little and listen a lot.